Welcome to NeuroNoodle's Neurofeedback and Neuropsychology Podcast, featuring tech legend Jake Gunkelman. He's the man who has read well over half a million brain scans, and Dr. Marie Swingle, author of iMinds. Our goal is to provide information and promote options for better mental health. The NeuroNoodle Podcast is supported by listeners and businesses just like you. Hola, Pete. Danny Gunkelman, we're that much closer to October. <laughs> uh, yeah, we are. Um, uh, I'm, I'm uh, already getting a little more excited than I should be this early. So, um, but you know, uh, uh, Santiago's back in uh, at home, and he's gonna fly back here. And uh huh gets in on the 10th we're gonna have a nice lunch together ahead of the, the whole thing and and uh kind of catch up see what he's been up to sure sure as, you, as as he said he's a glorified tech which is what i was you know so he now gets to travel all over the world doing lectures like i did and he seems to be well he's good at it number one and right he seems to enjoy the the, the travel and notoriety so i'm i'm glad to see him out there well once the jet lag is over maybe he'll uh pop on a show it's so hard to get him you know being on the other side of the world yeah possibly uh, uh possibly while he's here yeah um, yep, yep. we'll, we'll be uh thursday friday saturday you might be able to squeeze him in on a thursday morning um uh, from the bar <laughs> Are you talking about are you talking about the Susun Summit, Jay? Yeah. Yeah, he'll be here. It's a it's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday event. Catch him on on the morning uh on on Thursday. And you know, everybody'll be getting registered uh yeah. at eight o'clock or so and you know that they've got enough space um other than just the major lecture hall. Right, right. And you know, fi- find a Find a comfy spot and uh, grill him. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'll be popping in and out with my GoPro, sitting at the bar, uh, getting comments from everybody, putting it together and put, put putting it out there. What a blast. It should be wow. fun. It should be fun. Um, uh, the I'm the chair of the environment or vice chair of the environment climate committee here in town. And um, uh, they, they wanted everybody you know comments about what's going on and everything so i said well in october if you see a bunch of people wandering around town looking somewhat lost they're all neuroscientists be nice to them <laughs> and uh, they kind of wondered what that was about and so they're they're uh, the uh, two of them are uh, trying to get one or the other of the two newspapers here to write up a little story about the whole thing oh that's nice that's nice and, um, and they they all wanted uh a copy of the of the video, uh, that documentary video, and I, I told him, "Well, I have to make popcorn. It's two hours long, you know." So, uh, but, um, well, maybe we'll give him a scan. Tell him to come in, and uh, you know, we'll, <laughs> we'll do it as they're writing the article. <laughs> yeah, actually, one of the people on the city council is is uh, finishing her doctorate, and uh, she, she was interested. But she's in the midst of finishing her doctorate, so I think she's going to be too busy. A little busy, busy yeah. Well, well, you know, take three days out of your doctoral, you know, final wrap up and do something different. Uh-uh. <laughs> yeah, you got to be laser focused to get out the other end of a doctorate, you know. Jay, all I'm telling you is, I know you don't like. Well, you're 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 limited in your opinions on uh chat gpt but for all those doctorates and all those theses out there to have to write <laughs> these things it, it's a godsend <laughs> i i understand that if they see that you've used it that they also fail you um and there have been a number of lawyers who have submitted stuff with made up case law um chat gpt sometimes fabricates and uh, uh, the the judge fined them for uh, yeah. uh, a fake submission from yeah. ChatGPT. So, and there's there's AI out there now being trained to spot AI fabrications. And um, 
And then there's uh, AI to spot the AI fabrications to overcome the AI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so, so Jay, uh, spy counter spy, spy counter spy, right? <laughs> spy versus spy. Great comic. Yep. <laughs> So yeah. mental health and in news, Jay, pick your poison. Uh, seems like more people are hopping on board. The schools are getting more more involved. I mean, there's only so many times they have can... to. Yeah. Look, look at the liability if you don't. You know, it takes one. It takes one where you're not set up doing things right to end up draining the entire school budget from a a. a a head injury that's uh, uh, potentially fatal, but potentially life changing, uh, not for the better. You know, right. oh, I hit my head and now I see God, you know, no, this isn't what's happening. You know, this I hit my head and now I can't see straight and I'm dizzy. And, you know, that it, it, it's not, you know, clang and suddenly the world works, you know. If, if if that were the case, the headbangers would be way ahead of us, you know. <laughs> well, the schools and, you know, it's it's getting to be political season here as we're ramping up. They had the, the, the debates last night. And you would think that both sides, the Democrats and Republicans, could get together. And instead of instead of fighting about guns, fighting about getting money to figure out what the intent is that somebody wants to harm somebody with with those guns what yeah how 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 could it's not as sexy and it's harder to market but on the mental health aspect i'm just throwing it out there don't, don't you think the the school should uh because one of the articles we, uh, we're going to put in the in the show today talks about how i don't know what your gist of it was but how teachers should be paid as mental counselors uh what was your take on that? Well, schools should have um, counselors and assistance from community mental health folks. You know, uh, um, and community mental health folks consider volunteering a few hours a week at your local school. Your kid may be in school, but even if they're not, I mean, it's your town. Uh, do you want kids flying under the radar that are likely going to end up being, you know, mass murderers? Yeah. You you can spot trouble ahead of time and intervene. And, you know, it, it just takes one saving of one mass shooting to end up having a dramatic effect on a whole bunch of people's life trajectories. You know, <laughs> schools right. that are shot up real bad get torn down even. That you know they don't want the, the 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 thought of the school and the massacre to exist, so <clears throat> they they tear down a perfectly acceptable functional school building, you know. Uh, uh, but you can't have the the memorial basically to the uh, to the shooter and the event and everything. So I understand that, but it, you know, look at what you're saving if you if you volunteer at school. <clears throat> You have uh, education and training. You can spot personality disorders. Um, and with enough skill, uh, you can divert them from their current ill thought out, you know, plans to yes. actually change their life expectancy. Um, you know, it's, there are some that uh, are, are uh, awfully messed up, uh, given um, the, uh, the ACEs scores that you see out there, the uh, adverse childhood event scores. Um, and if you don't intervene very early and get that straightened out, long-term health consequences are there. High blood pressure, cardiac failures. Um, you know, just it's astounding the linkage between early life traumatic experiences, hearing gunshots in the neighborhood, um, yeah, fa family discord. I mean, all, all the various, there's a, there's a short list. If you've got more than four of the things on that list in your history, it predicts your health consequence long-term is gonna be negative. And when they came up with that, 
there were a few thousand data points and they thought, oh my God, look at this. You know, this is, this is predicting bad outcomes. And they showed it to a, um, a higher level researcher. They said, oh, this is terrible. But for this to be believable, you're going to need hundreds of thousands of cases. So they actually did the additional work to, to roll it out at that level. And it still absolutely was predictive. Um, if you, if you set up a meeting with all the social workers or psychologists or psychiatrists or whoever, all the professionals you want to gather together and you give them that, that test, um, and, and you can give it so they, they can tap it out and it goes mm -hmm. to a, a de-identified, you know, score tallying, um, you, you'll find that 30, 40% of the people in the room end up qualifying as being you know adverse childhood event marker for bad outcomes so it's it's not rare it's common and um and the stories behind it are just not shared i mean uh, <clears throat> when you've got your phd and you're sitting behind the desk you don't necessarily tell people about your awful childhood you know or you know, uh, family rape or, you know, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the brother-in-law that, uh, uh, comes over drunk, uh, waving a gun in the air, threatening to kill the family and stuff. I mean, yeah. don't, those things happen, <clears throat> but, but they're hidden. Uh -huh. And uh, unfortunately, uh, nobody can end up feeling, uh, like what their experience is like yeah yeah more common and not such a a freak outlier well let's take um, let's take, uh, take guns out of it because that's too hot of a topic uh video games because everybody wants to blame something to... <laughs> <laughs> and then they're not paying the parents anymore huh? right right <laughs> I, and the parents get pissed when you point the finger <laughs> down but <laughs> But if uh, what what like what is going on in that brain? So you do the ASA test and you see there was some problems growing up, and there's something yeah. uh, there's some dysregulation going on, and yeah. they're looking for an outlet, and they're gonna you know a pressure release valve is go going off. What what do video games come into play? And if they do, what's going on in the brain? Does that make them feel like well I can go kill people? Uh, what what do you think, Jay? You know, the anterior cingulate ends up uh, matching up with a video game. And you, if you have an obsessive match with it, it's providing you reward. And if you have a reward deficiency, uh, which can be established because of difficult childhood, Alan Shore's work showing in the first months to years of development, the parent face to face with the infant develops their neurochemistry and the, 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 the baby grimaces, the mother grimaces back. They, they have a feedback loop and that feedback loop of facial expressions ends up developing their ability to have empathy. Uh, without that developing, you're not likely to end up with that. And if you have poor parenting, gee, how could that happen? You know, uh, um, uh, uh, aces, uh, uh, you've got 10 aces. What's your parenting style going to be? You know, what, what, what parenting did you experience and that you learned this is how to do it? You know, this, it repeats itself. Uh, you were beaten. You're going to beat your kid. You know, that, that kind of thing. Well, it, it, it's, it's an awful thing to hand off, but the, the family dynamics are, are, are going to be you know, terrible. Uh, um, you can expect a negative outcome from uh, somebody that's had that kind of a negative experience. But we need to end up putting a stop to that. And part of that is actually identifying those that have high ACEs scores. And there, there are uh, there are meetings with school uh, folks where they discuss this and actually provide it initially to the teachers and teachers aides and superintendents and everybody in the school system as a workshop 
And uh, when they understand that, then it can be done with the kids and if, and anonymously uh, to the point where the, the, the kid's going to get flagged, but not to all the other kids. And at that point, the counseling. And again, <clears throat> if you've got a degree and you're doing, you know, psychological work, volunteer in your school. I mean, whatever happened to volunteerism? <laughs> you know, uh, oh, well, they're not paying me well enough. Well, it's because it's a volunteer position. You know, you, you do it out of the goodness of your heart and to save your community the trauma of whatever might happen if you don't do it. Um, anyway, I'm, uh, uh, I'm happy to see successful schools with positive outcomes. Um, the little school district I was involved in had um, the, a reputation of basically having uh, the, the largest uh, racial mix in the uh, Bay Area. It was a very small school district. It wasn't very well funded. And um, if you were in the top few percent and going to university, you had good chance of a good university. But the bottom half of the school basically didn't really have a career path. And uh, we got grants and set up uh, with a PhD teaching it, um, welding, carpentry, uh, 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 CAD CAM, so computer assisted design and manufacturing. Uh, over $400,000 grant to set up their CAD CAM program. Uh, all of the trades came in and set up for the, uh, you know, teaching uh, wiring for electricians and s welding for steam fitters and, you know, carpentry skilled for builders. And so every kid that learned that ended up having to incorporate math in a way that they didn't want to be for. But you can't do CAD CAM without a bit of math. So, but if you see a purpose for it, you, 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 you learn it. Um, the kids who went through that career academy is what they called it, um, end up getting snapped, snatched up right out of high school into um, uh, uh, apprenticeships and uh, uh, two, three years later, they're, they're making money hand over fist as a trade person. <laughs> you know, your, your plumber probably makes more than you do unless you are, are, are uh, really getting a gigantic income. And right. l let's say, oh, plumber, well, that's a terrible job. Well, how about the guy who owns the plumbing shop? Is that such a terrible job? You know, and you can move in the trades from a trade person to an owner of a business, to a person on the chamber of commerce, to somebody on the city council. I mean, it's, there's nothing at all wrong with being in the trades. Steam fitters. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, um, Employed. You know, yeah, and <clears throat> and out of high school, directly hired, as opposed to four years of expensive $20,000 a year or $25,000 a year college, you got $100,000 of debt four years later, and what kind of job do you get with a bachelor of science degree? Yeah, bartender. I don't know. Sales. You know, it's a, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's it's astounding how the people don't really uh, uh, realize the, the richness of the trades as an option, and it's it's disparaged. People look down on, unfortunately, uh, um, and inappropriately. Uh, folks that take that path. And well, what, if you want to have something done, you got to get somebody in the trades to come over and do it too. You know, what I mean, <laughs> you know. Well, it's uh, you, you have to get your hands dirty. Not a lot of people want to get the hands dirty, and you have the marketing power of colleges, especially the brand name schools that uh, have you looked yeah. down on that stuff. Yeah. And and when at when when knowledge was centralized, you had to go to one place to go 
get it. Now, if, yeah. if you want an education, you can go anywhere to get an education. So now the question is, how do you get somebody to be acclimated to live away from home? That's what college is for, the social connections <laughs> and the learning and all that. You know what it's called, Jay? Get a job, go in the military. It's not... Yeah. You should see me at a cocktail party. But but getting this back to schools and, and the counselors, I've seen some situations where I talk to school administrators and I say, you know, how's your mental health budget? Are you putting enough in there to keep keep an eye on what's going on? And then they say they have more than enough money. In fact, that uh, some of the parents complain that they don't want the counselors to get too in their kids' business. Um like one school was saying that uh, there were a lot of cases of DCFS being called uh, because of the counselor's involvement. And this is not a poor community that uh, I'm talking about. This is an affluent, you know, community. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have, well, there, there, there are perfectly respectable families that have awfully, awfully weird shit going on in them. So, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> Uh, what's that rich guy that killed his wife and you know the banking and yeah lives, we, you know taking numbers yeah so yeah and <laughs> yeah, everybody's got uh, something Jay yeah and if if you're concerned about people talking to your kid there must be something there that needs talking to yeah um, what are you what are you trying to hide <laughs> <laughs> but you know uh, um. Uh, uh, counselors are there to uh, be friendly, uh, uh, to, to, to allow somebody to feel uh, like they have somebody to talk to if they need somebody to talk to. They don't necessarily um, uh, reach out and uh, interact with every single kid because a lot of kids are doing just fine. You, you, yeah. you can see, open your eyes, look down the hall. Which kids walk down the hall happy chatting with friends? Who's the one walking along the lockers, looking at the lockers, not at the people, and, yeah. you know, with his head down or her head down? And you can tell when there's a troubled child. And if you're in the school system in that kind of a position, it's somebody to reach out to and uh, ask the instructors what's going on. Um, yeah, ask the kid, maybe bring the parents in for a, a discussion about what's going on. Uh, and it's, it's, the parents may find it awkward or difficult, but, you know, it's, it's, schools are not about the parents, it's about the kid. So uh, get over it, you know? Uh, well, do you think it's standardized across, you know, the nation? Uh, or, you know, the government should get more... I mean, I don't know. I'm getting ahead of my skis here. I'm just seeing that, you know, everybody's trying to do just like neurofeedback has their issues operating in silos. Yeah. You have the mental health businesses operating in their silos and they're, yeah. um, they're, 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 there isn't one body that said, hey, you know what? Take, like, does every school have to do the ASA test, Jay? No. OK. Uh, so and, and and, you know. Uh, not every school ends up even having uh, counselors. They've quite a few have had that department kind of shut down with budget cuts. Yeah. Um, they cut art, they cut music, but if you cut music, what suffers? Math. Math and yeah. music. You'd think, oh, how the hell do those go together? Yeah. Uh, in, in the brain, that's how they go together. People that learn music do better at math and vice versa. So, you know, you, uh, if you kind of shoot yourself in the foot by shutting down some departments and you're going to tank your scores in some other area. But um, it, schools also in their counseling department quite often restrict their counselors away from any diagnostic impression. If you diagnose something, then the child has something that requires additional services. Yeah. And if you require additional services, it's more expensive. 
Yeah. So if you if you identify a kid as ADD, they suddenly need accommodations and um, more time or a tutor or or or, and uh, that they, they, they shy away from the diagnosis. Uh, we proposed a, a way around that early in school. You it, uh, set up a room for kids to play in kindergarten, first grade. And one of the rooms has a game of a whack-a-mole. When they pop up, you whack them down. Simple game. Uh Omissions, commissions, reaction time, and variability. You have a CPT task in front of you if you're thinking of it as a CPT task. That's going to flag people that have inattention, uh, impulsivity, uh, processing problems. Um, How about finger tapping, right hand and left hand? You just have a neurophysiological measurement. If there's asymmetric and finger tapping speed, you can have them looked at. Um, uh, If you don't do very well in the whack-a-mole game, go over and play that brainwave game with that little dry sensor thing you sit on your head and uh, um, learn to fly those rocket ships. And now go back and you're going to be better at the whack-a-mole game. So by the time you've played the games, you actually have treated with no diagnosis the kids and uh, without the diagnosis there's no added services required and this was all recreational playtime you're not diagnosing anybody with anything uh, but the the effective intervention before diagnosis so the uh, subtle ADD kids end up being no longer ADD kids. That they've, they've actually had training in a game room. And, you know, that schools can do it. They have to think outside of their current lunchbox. Everyone carries a little pail to school, you know. Right. Uh, but you got to think outside of that much larger in order to set up a program that can end up helping the kids. Let, let's do some simple back-of-the-envelope math here, Jay. The, the budgets are getting cut, but yet everybody's getting labeled with the ADHD, ADD, and then you have to make accommodations for them. I don't think... At, the, there's a certain percentage that that are wrong, right? And that certain percentage that is wrong that be, winds up being more expensive than if you put some money in doing the testing, whether it's ASA, whether it's you're done with preschool, you'd get an EEG for an, an initial scan. Don't you think it would be you know the prevention side of things would be less expensive than the than the end result? Especially if the end result is a student walking in, shooting up the school. I mean, it, uh, if avoiding one of those is worth a gigantic, gigantic price, and and it's hard to budget that, you know, ho- what year do you pencil that in? You know, yeah, right. oh, we're going to have a school shooting next year. Uh, that's going to cost us an extra one point five million in uh, counseling services and repair services. And we're going to have to put in metal detectors and, you know, all the stuff that they do after the fact. Closing the barn door after the horse is gone, you know. Uh, um, Yeah, uh, uh, to not do preventative maintenance on a house is going to cost you a fortune. Not doing preventive maintenance in school structurally is going to cost you a fortune, perhaps a good chunk of your student population. And, you know, the, the students that are, that are gunned down, you know, that, that it isn't like they're cherry picking people that are failures that the people that get mowed down end up having, you know, a high probable success lives out there in front of them. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're wiping out the futures for, and the futures for families. It, it, 
if you are a couple and you have a kid and your kid is killed, the likelihood of the couple staying together is really, really reduced. And it, it, it throws a wrench into a relationship that's really hard to end up removing. So, uh, yeah, I, I can see no downside at all um, for, for investing in preventative counseling, student activities. You know, the schools always find some way to replace the turf on the football field and put up a nice scoreboard. You know, um, that that's always that they'll always find money for that. Um, Jay, Jay, at school, kids get labeled as a jack, uh, burnout, preppy, and this goth. You know, where they wear the dark and the black, and I don't know if you know anything about that, but I think the Columbine guys were sort of like in trench coats and dark and, and all that. Does that? Do you have any? You can't, you can't always judge by their clothing. They, yeah. Uh, however, um, it, it, when when people separate themselves from the rest of everybody in some way, it's, it's time to have a casual investigation about what their motivation is and what's yeah. going on with them. And it, it, you know, uh, um, the, there are a lot of the ones that I've seen um, that they knew the kids were, you know, not right. And, yeah. um, and unfortunately, you know, mother gets him a gun or whatever. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's astounding, uh, how, how easy those are to get. Um, but, yeah. if, but if everybody can, I guess, well, yeah, they, they were kind of weird. And I know you have first, you, you, you have rights in America. I was weird. Okay. I am weird, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but not in the way of, you know, gunning down classmates or something. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, I, <laughs> I just got stuck on science, you know? <laughs> so it, it I, this is a, the, the, if you do a QEG, is there anything in there that you would see that somebody would have that intent to want to harm somebody? There are things that can be seen that predict disinhibition, the right frontal affective gating location. Um, uh, for you to stop an impulse or an emotion that's inappropriate for expression. You know, you're in mixed company and that nasty, dirty joke comes to mind. It's not the time to tell it. The right frontal area should say, mm, maybe we'll tell that around the campfire with the guys tonight, not in mixed company at church today, you know? So, right, right, right. Uh, but, but there, that spot has to work and they've seen that spot not working in people that are jailed for crimes of passion that were violent murders that weren't thought out, but they were impulsive. that spot. Now, what's with that spot? There's a test you can do. It's called a go, no go, stop test. It's an event related potential, looking at the brain's response to stimuli. And the go, no go is normally like a one or a zero. Yeah, when you th when you see the one, you hit the button. Near the zero, you don't. So the, the go, no go task is going ones and O's and suddenly a stop sign pops up after it told you to go and so you're in the middle of hitting the button and you get a stop sign now that's an emergency stop you're stopping something you already got going where in the brain does this work the right amygdala picks up the sign of the emergency stop the the uh, insula and amygdala are hooked together and they hook to the lateral frontal area. That network is your ability to hit the brakes in an emergency. And it's the ability to gate your impulses and um, uh, an affect that's inappropriate. So if that spot's not working, 
Uh, you can spot that and fix that. You know, we can teach people with intractable epilepsy how not to have seizures. Some have been seizure-free and medication-free for seven years now. And, and they were basically told they'd have to have brain surgery because there was no way to stop their seizures with three or four meds. You know, some of them had more meds than are even really accepted in medical specialties. You're not supposed to have more than three anticonvulsants, and you can rotate them until you find the match that works, but you don't just stack them up. So, you know, um, if, if you see the spot, you can train the spot how to work better. So you don't have an impulsive, you know, um, affectively um, out of control individual. Kids have rage events. If your kid is having rage events, it's time to have their head examined to make sure it's just a snit as opposed to an epileptiform discharge with no seizure. Temporal lobe discharges quite often have out of control emotion, pseudo bulbar affect. And pseudo bulbar affect is an an emotion that doesn't make any sense. Little Johnny's out of control in a rage event and there's no reason for it. There's a reason for it in their head. You know, and there may not have been an objective thing that you think should trigger a rage event, but they're triggered. And they may not have a good memory of it. Uh, they may, in fact, in their rage, uh, whack themselves around till they actually get hurt. Uh, and not really realize it until after the fact. But if if there's rage events happening, you need to examine that, uh, that, that rage events and out of control uh, emotion. And when, when these, Jay, when these kids are having issues, look, neither one of us are psychologists, okay? Dr. Marie's not here today, so we get to play around. Uh, uh, but when you say these rage events, is that when you say a kid, you know, a kid is troubled when they harm animals? Is that like a rage event or what? Yeah, that that that's probably a step or two above rage events. Okay. That, that's that's already um, uh, somebody who's gaining pleasure out of harming. OK. Um, and that's uh, that they, they've learned that. And OK. Um, uh, and, that, and in the brain, I mean, is that the pleasure part of the brain? Is that something out of whack there? Like, uh, just like the people who find pain pleasurable, okay, uh, there are people that find that kind of an action to be exciting and pleasurable. Now, you know, their your pleasure center gets is fancy tickled a lot of different ways, and uh, whatever started tickling it with that uh, is unfortunate. But you've got to intervene early on that. Otherwise, you've got a, a kid who's a murderer later in life. I mean, harming animals early in life is a, 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 a well-known precursor. Yeah. Now, it's, it's not like um, uh, 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 some people will say, oh, this is a gateway drug uh, because you took it before you ended up taking something else. Well, to that extent, mother's milk must have been the gateway drug that preceded everything else, you know. So, <laughs> um, yeah, you, you you can't just use temporal chain uh, to prove causality, uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, harming animals uh, and and gaining some pleasure out of that is is enough of a disturbed thought process that it needs to be intervened on. There's a, a deep personality disorder. Um, uh, the the affective gating uh, uh, is not stopping you from doing really a damaging uh, thing. And uh, um, it, 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 you know, things like that escalate. If, um, if you're doing something to get some pleasure from it, um, the thing you're doing to get the pleasure usually has to escalate and escalate and less escalate to keep getting you the pleasure. Very much like a drug uh, that provides you the neurochemistry of pleasure. 
uh, <clears throat> most of the time it takes more of that drug to keep doing it. And uh, so activities that you do to get your jollies end up escalating. And, you know, you, you you could you could pick that conceivably you could get a clue on the EEG to look in that area or to say you know something could happen along the line I would imagine and that's just on the preventative preventative side and then on the other end jails are supposed to be a place where you rehabilitate to become a better member of society. <laughs> you, you, you've been reading the myth. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're paying for it. And yeah. they're just, it's like uh, getting an MBA in crime, you know, going to, going yeah. to the jails. Uh, you would think that conceivably the, you should do something with the brain to re rehabilitate the brain to make them a better member of society. There are some people that go through prison that end up coming out the other end with degrees. Um, a, a good friend of mine got his doctorate from a federal penitentiary. Um, and, you know, it, it, it wasn't like they gave it to him out of pity either. He did very, right. very high level work. Um, and, and he was brilliant. Um, he actually wrote his own uh, defense and, and was released from uh, uh, jail on a technicality he found. Uh, he, he went into the library at the jail and found it to be a mess. And he volunteered to re restructure the card catalog and, and uh, uh, re you know, reorganize the right, library right. in a more library-like way other than just having books on shelves. And, uh, and he, yeah, he, uh, did research in the law library portion and uh, wrote himself and his uh, his cellmate. Um, now, these are the two people that made Orange Sunshine. They were the chemists yeah. that made Orange Sunshine back in the day. Why would the federal penitentiary put them in the same cell? <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, uh, San's girlfriend gave him a kiss with a balloon in it, uh, which he swallowed and then retrieved. Yeah. And it had a, enough LSD in it to get everybody in the prison high. And they put it into their dinner in the in the kitchen. Uh, you know. <laughs> oh well, you know. So so the. Life is strange, and and you know, uh, prison management is apparently not all that hot either. So, yeah. um, but he, you know, uh, Tim Scully uh, uh, got his PhD from what is now Saybrook University, a distance learning uh, university, um, a, a degree in in psychology, and uh, a multivariate analysis of. Uh, multiple systems in the body and its relationship to consciousness. So uh, uh, really a high level study. Well, Jay, we, we I know the, uh, the viewers and listeners have heard us talk about these same things before, but they continually come up in the news, school mental health. Okay. Politics and paying for the mental health. Is it preventative or do you deal with it after the fact? And these are the things that, need to be discussed to get more people on the same boat if so we can get organized so we can be yeah. more efficient on this so yeah and it's hard to argue for preventative uh because people don't see the imminent yeah uh problem and uh, as soon as it's done it's too late um it yeah. you know uh, um uh, it, it had been preventative to have replaced the lead pipes in Flint when they found that they had lead pipes. But, you know, San Francisco has lead pipes in the downtown under all those high rises. Yeah, they have large you know, lead you know pipe tents? water supply. Uh, and they haven't replaced those. Yeah. You know, the, so there's, you know, the, 
the, the, the, there's problems that people know about that they, they just don't choose to fix um, because oh. they haven't become an acute problem yet and nobody's pointed at them as a, a chronic problem like lead poisoning, although oh. they should. Yeah. You know? So, in, in fact, if you look around the United States and you did water testing in a lot of the communities, you'd find a lot of them don't really meet anywhere close to appropriate drinking water standards. Flint, Michigan. And, and uh, PFAS, the, the lifetime chemicals that are in it, don't really have appropriate standards yet. And, um, and that stuff's ubiquitous now. It, right. It's hard to find a water supply that doesn't have it. Yeah. Jay Gunkelman, another great episode of the Neuro Noodle Neuro Feedback Podcast. Enjoy and your week. If your child is having rage events, have them looked at with somebody who has EEG equipment and have that EEG looked at by somebody who knows EEG well enough to identify transient discharges that can be treated so that the rage events cease. They don't have them anymore. You can turn the child's trajectory of their life around now before the problem escalates to something tragic. So it's harder uh, to correct. Yeah. <clears throat> and, it, you know, I, just this morning online, uh, um, uh, the uh, a practitioner uh, uh, posted uh, if if your kid's having rage events, it may not just be the software; it might be the hardware. And then the mother's testimonial below that that her kids had, uh, you know, one one kid had attention problems, the other one had rage events, and you know, six months later, it's proof positive that it works you know the rages are gone the child's successful you know thank goodness uh, for for the treatment and um it's yeah it's um it is life-changing the the work i do with intractable seizures is so dramatically life-changing but the same thing if you're dealing with the non-convulsive discharges that are creating rage events and out of control emotions and, and behavior. Uh, uh, changing that is just as life-changing as stopping seizures because it's, it's a similar underlying process. 60% of the autism population have uncontrolled discharges in the EEG that need to be trained away. A quarter to a third of the ADD population have it. A third of the people that have mood problems where the mood doesn't make sense, again, pseudo-bulbar affect, a third of them, a third of the psychotics, you know, and if you give an antipsychotic to somebody who's got psychosis and is due to a discharge, they get worse, not better. So it, it, it's time to start using the EEG for what it can be used for clinically. Mayo Clinic showed a dramatic underutilization of EEG just for traditional applications, not for anything extraordinary or out of the box, just traditional applications. Anyway, uh, uh, I, I will rant all day. So, uh, <laughs> and I can see we're we're running short on Jay rant time here. So, uh, uh, Jay, you better get you better pet your dog. Well, he's he's sleeping right next to me here. You can see us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look at that. His, look at that. His little GPS uh, on yeah. his neck there. So. We all need a GPS, don't we, Jay? Well, you know, having a having a a dog who sleeps on my lap is kind of like having a warm weighted blanket. You know, it's very calming. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and you know me, I need to be calmed anyway. So, <laughs> well, we'll try to rally you up next week, Jay. <laughs> we'll have see a, you then. Have a great weekend, buddy. Say hi to Renita. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Two at weeks. That's the soon summit. You better and, believe it. Um, and that should be a hoot. Uh, I think we're going to auction off uh, oh, the beard. Yeah. It's, it's getting a little longer. Yeah. Uh, so, um, 
it's probably time to auction that off and um we'll we'll, we'll see how that goes no offense jay i don't think i'll be the first bidder <laughs> <laughs> i think i'm gonna put down a couple of thousand to keep it <laughs> okay <laughs> But in, in the beard bidding, if you make a bid, whether you win or lose, your bid stays in the pot, you know? So, right, right. Okay. Uh, fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. If I put in two grand and people put in more than that, the beard's gone. Uh, so anyway. All right, Jay. Uh, it's, it's all for students, you know? Of course. It's, it's, it's my farcical uh, student funding. It's a low overhead uh a uh, student funding source or underhead so, yes yeah, very low overhead <laughs> underhead <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so low it's under so jay we've der- derailed goodbye <laughs> got it bye-bye the neuronoodle podcast is supported by listeners and businesses just like you